What's up, you big beautiful nerds? This is Chesh, and today we're going to be talking about... Haha! <laughs> Clothis, God of Destiny! This is a group slug deck. Yes, I realize that most people probably maybe don't remember what a group slug deck is because you don't see them very often. They're usually piloted by Mogus, and they're usually making you discard everyone's hands and destroying everyone's permanence and some land destruction and maybe some mass land destruction. This is not that deck. This is different because this is Clothus. So this is one green and one red and one colors for a legendary enchantment creature god, indestructible. As long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven, Clothus isn't a creature. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land, add a red or a green. Otherwise, you gain two life and Clothus deals two damage to each opponent. So, first off the bat, Snake Umbra. This three CMC enchantment says that uh, the creature gets plus one, plus one and has whenever this creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. Yeah, so we're going to be getting a whole lot of cards from this if we're doing all that damage. So, that is how Clothis is going to run. We're going to basically be wanting to do a group slug deck. What is group slug? Well, we'll get there pretty quickly. Don't you worry about that. Group slug is all about damaging the entire table, including yourself, but hopefully damaging your opponents more for you to gain the advantage and eke out a win. So, Torbrin, Thane of Redfell, comes into this. Legendary Dwarf Noble 2-4. If a red source you control would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage, plus two instead. Furnace of Wrath uh, is another card that I couldn't find my copy of, so you can look it up. It's in the deck list down below. We also have Angrath's Marauders. This 7-cost pirate is only a 4-4, but if a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. If a source you control, a source you control, not just a creature, not just an instant or sorcery, any source which is fantastic so next up we need stuff that's going to hurt all of our opponents how about a citadel of pain this three converted mana cost enchantment has at the end of each player's turn citadel of pain deals x damage to that player where x is the number of untapped lands he or she or they control it was much better back in the days of mana burn <laughs> Because you were forcing people to tap, and it, you were either taking damage or you were taking damage. Zozu the Punisher, of course, is in this deck, this legendary goblin warrior. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, Zozu deals two damage to that land's controller. So this is all punishment effects. We've got Burning Earth. Whenever a player taps a non-basic land for mana, Burning Earth deals one damage to that player. We have Rampaging Ferocidon. Players can't gain life. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield, Rampaging Ferocidon deals one damage to that creature's controller. We also have, of course, Mana Barbs. Each time any land is tapped for mana, Mana Barbs deals one damage to that land's controller. We have Harsh Mentor. Whenever an opponent activates an ability of an artifact, creature, or land on the battlefield and it's not a mana ability, Harsh Mentor is real harsh and will deal them two damage. Overabundance, a card that not many people probably remember, but whenever a player taps a land for mana, that player adds one additional mana to his or her or their mana pool of the same type. And then Overabundance deals one damage to him or her, or two damage if you've got Marauders out, or, you know, stuff like that. They stack up, multipliers are great. Primal Order, of course, uh, I think some people will be familiar about uh, with this one in maybe CDH circles. During each player's upkeep, Primal Order deals to that player an amount of damage equal to the number of non-basic lands they control. So, if you've got a very expensive mana base, this is not going to be your friend. We don't... We play quite a few non-basic lands and we're prepared to take some damage and that's fine. So, I mean, it's probably not going to kill us, but... Uh, be, be, be maybe a bit liberal with, with what you do there. Speaking of damaging everyone, 
we want to pull out some mongers <laughs> from Macadian masks. What? Warmonger. This is a monger, a creature monger. It's probably been updated to a torrent or something, I'm sure. It's a 3-3, three, three, and for two mana, Warmonger deals one damage to each creature without flying, and each player, any player may pay this to play this ability. On the other side of that, we have Squallmonger, which deals one damage to each creature with flying, and each player, any player may play this ability. We of course also have Chandra, because there's a twofold here, so exile the top card of your library, you can cast that card, and if you don't, Chandra deals two damage to each opponent. So that's pretty cool. Can ramp you for two red if you really want to. Deals four damage to target creature, which we don't care about doing ever. Just don't do it. It's just not great. Uh, unless you, I guess, you really need to. Uh, but the minus seven is you get an emblem with whenever you cast a spell, this emblem deals five damage to target creature or player, which can end the game quite well. We have our Rumbling Slum. This 5544 mana is amazing. At the beginning of your upkeep, Rumbling Slum deals one damage to each player. We of course have a Goblin Chain Willer. First strike, when it enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to each opponent and each creature and each player's walker that they control. We of course have a Flame Rift, deals four damage to each player. Just think about having Furnace of Wrath out and doubling that to like eight damage per player. Sounds pretty damn good. All right, here's, <laughs> here's some fun for you. Armageddon Clock. Uh, I think this one's revised, but uh, put one counter on Armageddon Clock during each of your upkeeps. At the end of your upkeep, each player takes damage equal to the number of counters on the clock. Any player may spend four mana during any upkeep to remove a counter. Now, pay attention, any upkeep. Just saying, any upkeep. All right. So now that we have punishment, we also have a way to deal damage to our opponents and make them regret face everything that they've ever believed in. We need some card draw to kind of uh, power our way with this. So we're of course playing a copy of Wheel of Fortune, uh, which I know is out of reach for most players, but uh, look, it'll be the best 70 to 90 US you'll ever spend. All players must discard their hands and draw seven cards. Wrong way around, wrong way around. We have Reforge the Soul, which is pretty much the same, but basically a fixed card with a miracle cost. We have Corvath's Fury. For each player, choose friend or foe. Each friend discards all cards from their hand and then draws that many cards plus one. Each foe will be taking damage equal to the number of cards in their hand. I wonder which one we're going to choose. Momentous Fall, sacrifice uh, a creature as an additional cost, and then you draw cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power, and then you gain life equal to its toughness. Now, there we go. I wonder what we would do that for. I have no idea. Maybe for good old Combustible Gearhawk, which is a 6-6. Six, six. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent may have you draw three cards. If the player does not, Put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard, and then Gimbusable Gil Hulk deals damage to that player equal to the number, of the, the total converted mana cost of those cards, not the number, because I am stupid today. It's been a long day. I've been at work all day. We've got, of course, Harmonize to draw three cards. We have Ground Seal. When it enters the battlefield, we draw a card. I'm counting it under card draw and hate, I guess. Cards in graveyards can't be the target of spells or abilities, which doesn't really care. We don't care that much. And of course, we've got old Sin Prodder. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library. Any opponent may have you put that card into your graveyard. If a player does, Sin Prodder then deals damage to that player equal to that card's converted mana cost. Otherwise, put it in your hand. More punishing effects. All right. So we've gone through punishment. We've gone through a bit of card draw. Now we need to go through a way to power out stuff and to actually cast things as fast as we can and pump mana into stuff. So it's rare that somebody's not playing blue at the, at the table, so we're going to go with a carpet of flowers. During your main phase, you may add up to X mana of any one color to your mana pool where X is the number of islands target opponent controls. 
We're all going to go on a collective voyage which has joined forces. So starting with you, each player may pay any amount of mana. Each player searches their library for up to X basic land cards where X is the total amount of mana paid this way and then puts them onto the battlefield tapped and shuffles their library. We're also going to tempt people with discovery. Tempting offer, search your library for a land card, any land card, and put it onto the battlefield. Each opponent may search their library for a land card and put it onto the battlefield as well. For each opponent who searches a library this way, search your library for another land card and put that onto the battlefield. Then each player who searched their library shuffles it. This is Pilgrimage, of course. Search your library for up to two basic forest cards. Reveal those cards, put one onto the battlefield tapped, the rest into your hand, shuffle your library. If you've got spell mastery, if there's two or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard, search your library for up to two, sorry, three basic forest cards instead of two. Blah, I always get that wrong. Spring Bloom Druid. Look at that. That is just, it's British. So much goodness. Thank you, Modern Horizons. When the Spring Bloom Druid enters the battlefield, you can sacrifice a land. If you do, search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, and shuffle your library. Cavalier of Thorns, of course. Reach for a 5-6. When it enters the battlefield, reveal the top five cards of your library. Put a land card from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. When Cavalier of Thorns dies, you can exile it. If you do, put another target card from your graveyard on top of your library. Pretty cool dual use, to be honest. Sakura Tribe Elder, Steve! Sacrifice Steve, search your library for a basic land card, put that card onto the battlefield tapped, shuffle your library. We have Explore, you can play an additional land this turn, draw a card. Sylvan Scrying, search your library for a land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, shuffle your library. Now, you can probably see a little bit of a lands theme here of like, we're searching for particular lands, and we're gonna get into that in just a second. Dryad of the Elysian Grove. You can play an additional land on each of your turns. Lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. I wonder what we'd be doing with that. With all of this ramp, we want to get a bit greedy, so we're going to play our Horn of Greed. Whenever a player plays a land, that player draws a card. We're getting there. Speaking of damaging everyone, I don't know if I wanted to put this under Mana Rocks or whether I wanted to put this under Damage Everyone, but Cryptoth Fragment enters the battlefield tapped. Tap it and add one mana of any color to your mana pool and each player loses one life. Don't worry about the rest of it, it doesn't matter. He says as he smacks the new phone. Let's bring it back up, bring it back up. Whew, that was close. Soul Ring, I just wanted to show off my pretty one. Because it's pretty. This, look, fast mana is great. I don't own any of the big fast mana cards. Yes, I realize I'm saying this when I have a Wheel of Fortune. But a Wheel of Fortune is ultimately more useful to me than fast mana cards. However, Soul Ring in here allows us to activate our mongers nice and, and steadily for, you know, give, supplying two mana basically. Commander's Fear, not only does it tap for a mana in your color identity, but you can actually sacrifice it after you've tapped it to draw a card. Arcane Signet, much the same, except without the sacrifice to draw a card, makes me sad. Dark Steel Ingot, uh, tap to add one mana of any color to your mana pool and it's indestructible just in case. Uh, Dockside Extortionist, I never know whether I'm supposed to be including in ramp or with mana rocks, because I guess it provides mana rocks, but technically is going to ramp you depending on how many artifacts are already on the field, so that's an awkward one. It's it's a great card, and if you didn't get it in the commander deck, go out and buy the commander deck for it. Speaking of disappointing, I'm not so sure about Nyx Lotus. This is very much a flex spot. Uh, every time that I've gone to play Nyx Lotus, it just has not... It's not been good. Four mana for a tapped artifact, who knew that it wouldn't be good? Uh, tap, choose a color, add an amount of mana of that color to your devotion to that color. So if you've got three red pips out on the field, it'll tap for three red. It's just, just doesn't really feel worth it. All right, so we also want to kind of slow down the table a little bit. 
usually with the uh, the, the the slug decks, the, the group slugs, they play sometimes mass land destruction. We don't want to do that because it feels like a rat move. Uh, and we want to keep our friends, mostly. So instead, we're going to go the next best thing and we're going to play our stacks friends. So Winter Orb, no player may untap more than one land during their untap phase. We have Root Maze, artifacts and lands come into the battlefield tapped. Blood Moon, non-basic lands are mountains. Stranglehold, your opponents can't search libraries and they can't begin extra turns. They actually skip those extra turns. Burning Sands, whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, that creature's controller sacrifices a land. Be careful with that one. Uh, so we're going to use those to slow down our opponents so that we can get a bit more set up. If our plan fails... I'm playing it again, Underworld Breach, because it is the best card in red. I kid you not, the amount of times this card has saved my bacon. I mean, look... <laughs> It's hard when you know that you can crank out a whole bunch of mana. What are you going to use it for? Well, I mean, you know, being able to wheel again and again because you have all the mana to do so is pretty hilarious. But the better one to do with this is if you can Flame Rift for the win and end the game while just burning absolutely everyone on the table. All right, look, it might not work. So instead... We do have Prismatic Omen, Scape Shift, and of course, my favourite, Valakut the Molten Pinnacle to help finish off our opponents. We have Scape Shift. We can utilise Scape Shift. All of our lands will basically just be lands of every type anyway between this and the Dryad. So we should be fine. Um, to damage everyone, we still have a Shivan Gorge in here. One red and two colours tap to deal one damage to each opponent. Uh, if we get really desperate, we can try and win with our Field of the Dead, because again, we are a secret scapeshift deck, which is no one is expecting out of a, a group slug deck. And of course, if we get really, really desperate, here's some beautiful tech. This is from Ice Age, and this is Glacial Chasm. Don't be scared by the cumulative, cumulative upkeep. True life. Oh, that's just painful. When Glacial comes into play, sacrifice a land. You cannot attack. All damage dealt to you is reduced to zero. So you can keep paying life. That's not going to affect it. But you can't actually have damage dealt to you. So effectively, you can shut everyone out of the game if you need three more turns, let's say, and then just glaze your chasm and then just smash the board with all of your damage. Clothis is probably one of the coolest designs I've seen in a while for a new commander. Uh, I, I really dig it. I've been having so much fun with this deck, and I, I tell you, you should really try this out, tinker with it. Screw around with it, because I think you'll find it's pretty cool. It's a great counterbalance to those ugly group hug decks with this kind of the same theme. I guess this is more a group hug closer to stacks kind of style of deck. Um, and I don't play stacks at all. I have tried. I do not like it. It is too slow. This has options to play. That means that you're not doing the same repetitive thing over and over. This, you actually get to make meaningful decisions. Not that, sorry, stacks players, I'm sure you make meaningful decisions. The opposite app goes cancel constantly. But this feels like it has a lot of play to it, and I urge you to try it out. All right. Look, I hope you've loved this deck tech as much as I have, because I've been having a lot of fun with this deck, absolutely. Keep your eyes on the channel for some cool stuff coming out up about Ikoria in April. Um, hopefully early April we will see, uh, because there's a lot of stuff that's going to be coming out, and there might be some special videos, we'll see on that. Don't forget to go to Inked Gaming and use the code down below, which is Chesh10, it's the codes below, uh, and check out puremtgo.com, because they're the ones who I write these articles for, and usually chuck these videos at. So thank you very much for hanging out. Like, comment, subscribe. I'm Cheshire. Have a great day.